How do you destroy a bunker buried so deep that it is even hard to reach it in the first place? During the 1991 Gulf War, U.S. forces faced a challenge with heavily fortified underground military bunkers in Iraq that existing munitions couldn't penetrate. In response, the U.S. Air Force rapidly developed a new bunker-busting bomb, the GBU-28, capable of reaching and destroying these targets. This innovation was so effective that it contributed to Saddam Hussein's surrender. Stay tuned to learn how the U.S. achieved this breakthrough. In August of 1990, the world watched in alarm as Iraq, under the leadership of Saddam Hussein, launched an invasion into Kuwait. This aggressive act was driven by a blend of ambition and desperation. Saddam sought to annex Kuwait, eyeing its vast oil reserves as a means to bolster Iraq's faltering economy and assert regional dominance. Beyond mere territorial expansion, Saddam's motives were deeply entangled in financial straits. Iraq was mired in debt from its prolonged conflict with Iran in the 1980s and Kuwait's significant loans to Iraq during this period became a contentious point. Saddam's refusal to repay these debts, coupled with his desire to control Kuwait's oil wealth, set the stage for the invasion. The move was also a blatant challenge to the existing geopolitical order, threatening not just the sovereignty of Kuwait, but also the stability of global oil markets. The international response to Iraq's aggression was swift and decisive. The United States, under President George H.W. Bush, took the lead in forming a coalition of 35 countries, determined to repel Iraqi forces from Kuwait and restore international law and order. This coalition, characterized by an unprecedented level of international cooperation, including both Western and Arab nations, initiated a series of air campaigns targeting Iraqi military infrastructure and strategic sites. However, as the conflict progressed, the coalition forces encountered a significant obstacle that they were ill-prepared to overcome. Iraq's strategic use of deeply buried concrete bunkers posed an unprecedented challenge to the coalition's military capabilities. These bunkers, housing critical Iraqi intelligence and command personnel, were constructed 30 to 50 feet beneath the Earth's surface, rendering them impervious to the coalition's standard ordnance. The BLU-109 bombs, which were designed for hardened penetration, could only breach four to six feet of reinforced concrete. This limitation meant that despite the coalition's air superiority and technological advancements, Saddam's command infrastructure remained frustratingly out of reach. The inability to neutralize these bunkers not only complicated the coalition's military strategy, but also prolonged the conflict, giving Saddam's forces a temporary but significant strategic advantage. In the face of the seemingly impossible challenge posed by Iraq's deeply buried bunkers, the United States military and its coalition introduced the Army 8-inch howitzer barrels as the casing for this new bomb. This idea was nothing short of revolutionary, stemming from an acute understanding of the unique properties of the howitzer barrels. These barrels were designed to withstand the immense pressures of firing large artillery shells, suggesting they had the strength and durability required to penetrate deep into the ground without deforming or breaking apart. By repurposing these barrels, the engineers envisioned creating a bomb with the necessary heft and structural integrity to breach the bunker's defenses. The barrels, originally intended for a wholly different purpose, possessed the ideal characteristics for the task. They were long enough to house a significant explosive charge and sturdy enough to penetrate deeply buried structures. Moreover, their availability meant that the project could move forward rapidly without the delays that would have accompanied the development of a completely new casing from scratch. This solution, however, was not without its challenges. Transforming a piece of artillery into a bomb casing required significant modifications and precise engineering. The barrels needed to be cut, reshaped, and fitted with a nose cone and tail fins to ensure they could be accurately delivered to their target. Every step of this process had to be meticulously planned and executed, with adjustments made in real time as the design evolved. Luckily, Lockheed Martin stepped up to the challenge. Lockheed, Air Force engineers, and the Water Vliet Arsenal embarked on a project that would normally take months, if not years, to complete. Their goal was ambitious, to design, test, and manufacture a bomb in less than four weeks. The engineers brought to the table a deep understanding of military needs and operational requirements, while Lockheed contributed its cutting-edge technology and manufacturing capabilities. The involvement of the Water Vliet Arsenal a facility with a long history of precision engineering and expertise in artillery manufacturing further enhanced the collaboration. Together, these entities formed a powerhouse team capable of tackling the daunting task ahead. The challenge of designing the bomb within the constraints of time was formidable. Engineers and designers had to make critical decisions quickly, 
often based on incomplete information or untested theories. They had to ensure that the bomb would reach its target and withstand the impact of penetrating deep layers of earth and concrete. Manufacturing the bomb in less than four weeks presented its own set of challenges. The Watervliet arsenal, known for its precision in machine gun barreling, was suddenly thrust into a race against time. The facility had to adapt its processes to meet the unique specifications of the bomb, often working around the clock in multiple shifts. Changes to the design were made on the fly, requiring a flexible approach to manufacturing that was uncommon in such a precision-oriented environment. The arsenal's machinists and engineers had to maintain the highest standards of quality while operating under an unprecedented timeline. The culmination of the intensive efforts to develop a bomb capable of penetrating deeply buried bunkers was marked by a series of test drops in Nevada and New Mexico. These tests were designed to validate the bomb's effectiveness, a crucial step before its deployment in war. In Nevada, the first test drop was conducted in a remote desert location, chosen for its similarity to the arid landscapes of the Gulf. The bomb, mounted on an F-111 fighter jet, was released at high altitude to simulate operational conditions. The moment of truth came when the bomb struck the desert floor at supersonic speed. The impact was tremendous, burying the bomb more than 100 feet into the earth, far surpassing expectations of its penetration capabilities. The bomb had not only reached its target depth, but had also buried itself beyond expectations, demonstrating its potential to breach even the most fortified underground bunkers. This initial success was followed by a more structured test at Holloman Air Force Base in New Mexico, where a rocket sled propelled the bomb against a 22-foot-thick stack of steel-reinforced concrete slabs. This test was designed to mimic the defense construction of the Iraqi bunkers. The results were astonishing. The bomb punched through the barrier and continued for several meters before coming to a stop. This unequivocal demonstration of the bomb's penetrating power provided the conclusive evidence needed to confirm its effectiveness. The ability to breach such a significant depth of reinforced concrete validated the bomb's design and its potential as a game-changing weapon in the Coalition's arsenal. These tests underscored the bomb's unique capability to penetrate deep into concrete and bury itself beyond retrieval, a feature that was critical in its intended role against the Iraqi bunkers. The bomb's performance in Nevada and New Mexico proved that it could deliver a lethal payload to targets previously deemed inaccessible offering a new strategic advantage. The success of these tests was a morale booster for the coalition forces, providing a tangible solution to one of the conflict's most daunting challenges. The innovation and ingenuity behind the bomb's development were now proven, paving the way for its deployment and its eventual role in shifting the balance of power in Operation Desert Storm. The operational deployment of the GBU-28 Bunker Buster in Saudi Arabia marked a significant milestone in the coalition's efforts during Operation Desert Storm. The GBU-28's deployment was carefully orchestrated, with two Air Force F-111 fighters selected for the initial mission. These aircraft were chosen for their ability to carry the heavy bunker busters and for their proven effectiveness in precision bombing. The target for the GBU-28 was a command and control bunker in Iraq, believed to house top military officials and critical communication equipment. The choice of target underscored the strategic importance of the mission. By disabling Iraq's command and control infrastructure, the coalition aimed to cripple Saddam Hussein's ability to coordinate his forces effectively. The anticipation and tension were palpable as the F-111s took off from Saudi Arabia, each carrying a single GBU-28 towards their designated target. The impact of the GBU-28 on the command and control bunker was devastating. The bomb penetrated the bunker's reinforced concrete shell, causing significant damage to the structure and its contents. Surveillance and reconnaissance data collected after the strike provided clear evidence of the bunker buster's effectiveness. Images showed a large hole in the bunker's roof, with subsequent assessments indicating that the bomb had reached and detonated within the bunker, achieving its intended effect. The damage inflicted was a testament to the bomb's design and the precision with which the mission was executed. The deployment and successful use of the GBU-28 bunker buster in Operation Desert Storm had a profound impact on the outcome of the conflict playing a pivotal role in leading to the ceasefire and Iraq's eventual surrender. The psychological and strategic implications of this technological marvel cannot be understated. It sent a clear message to the Iraqi leadership and military forces that their most fortified positions were no longer safe. This realization likely contributed to the erosion of Iraqi morale and the weakening of their resolve to continue the conflict under such dire circumstances.
While many factors contributed to the conclusion of Operation Desert Storm, the psychological impact of the Bunker Buster's success cannot be overlooked. The knowledge that the Coalition had a weapon capable of reaching and destroying even the most protected military assets likely hastened Iraq's decision to seek an end to hostilities. It demonstrated a technological and strategic superiority that Iraq could not hope to match, let alone overcome. Moreover, the use of the GBU-28 highlighted the Coalition's resolve to employ advanced technology to achieve its objectives, further demoralizing the Iraqi forces and contributing to a sense of inevitability regarding the conflict's outcome, which led to the eventual surrender. And there you have it, the story of a weapon that altered the course of a war. What are your thoughts on the GBU-28 and its impact on modern warfare? Do you think it served to create peace or just to instill fear? Drop your comments below. We'd love to hear from you. Don't forget to like this video and subscribe to our channel for more fascinating insights and stories. Hit the bell icon to stay updated on our latest uploads. Until our next deep dive, stay curious.